God has a message for you. And so, Brother Jeff, you come ahead. For that purpose, I tremble every time I come up here. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> I promise to do my best not to throw pins at anybody this morning. <coughs> uh, several years ago, quite a many years ago I preached a message called the thronging of Christ which kind of revealed the modern American Christian as infatuated for what Jesus could do for them right but who was just really had no use for the practical applications of Christianity then about three or four years ago I preached another message which I expounded upon that one and I called it the Jesus cult which kind of exposed the lure of false Christs in our that are so prevalent in our present day. I'd like to kind of continue on that theme here this morning with the traits and the motivations of those who embrace these false Christs. <clears throat> this morning I want to speak on the theme of loving a lie. Anyone who's familiar with the story of the Iliad knows that the Greeks went and besieged the city of Troy. And for ten long years they besieged that city and they couldn't penetrate the walls. And then one day after ten years, one of, the, one of the Greek soldiers named Odysseus, he came up with a plan. So the Greeks set this large wooden horse before the doors of Troy and they retreated and backed off. And in that day, whenever an enemy was defeated or capitulated, they would leave a gift. And the Trojans thought that that's what this was. So they watched it for a little while. And after a few days, a couple of days when nothing seemed amiss, they opened the doors of the city and brought in this great wooden horse. They closed the gates again and they went to celebrating. Well, unbeknownst to them, because of their lack of careful observation, because they let down their guard, they didn't realize that this horse was not what it was presented as. This horse was a deception. And the Greeks achieved their goal through this deception, through this subtle deception. Because after the Trojans went and began to celebrate, there were some Greek soldiers hidden inside of this hollowed out wooden horse. They got out of the horse, opened the gates, and the Greeks came in and stormed the city and took over Troy. Jesus said there would be great deception. Deception so great that, would, that it would endanger the souls of his very sheep. Right. So great was this deception that Jesus said you need to be concerned because this thing could deceive the very elect mm, right. if it were possible. He wasn't speaking of a deception so prevalent in the world as to be obvious to the seeking soul. That's not what he was talking about. It wasn't something so blatantly antichrist as, as Islam or Catholicism or secular humanism. It wasn't something so blatant as that. It was a deception so subtle of which he spoke, so crafty that it could only have been conceived by the enemy himself. The deception I'm talking about is that of a false, false Christ, an ambiguous truth, an almost Jesus. A deception so cunning, a counterfeit so convincing that the truth is shunned as error. Right. The Son of God is replaced with some marred caricature. Mm -hmm. One man has said that Satan's strategy to accomplish his purpose is not so much a denial of truth, but an imitation of it. Right. This is the danger that we live in today. Yes. This is the danger that is so prevalent around us that we see some of these things and we just we're just awed with shock. I'm convinced that the danger of which Jesus spoke was the wholesale misrepresentation of the Word of God, a 
false Christ, a plethora of convenient messiahs, mm -hmm. a bargain bin savior. All or any one of those are the deceptions with which we are plagued today. I've often said, oh, that I've often pray, said and prayed, God, if, if men are going to reject Jesus, at least let them be presented with the right one to reject. Amen. Yes. And that's the thing that weighs on my heart on a daily basis. Because the Christ that is being predominantly presented today is a false Christ. It's a lie. It's a low-cost imitation. Right. And that's not all. It's not all that just people are rejecting this. It's not only that this false Christ is rejected because he is inconsistent and he's irrational. You know, the thinking mind looks upon some of the things, some of the proposals that professing Christians set before people these days. The thinking and logical mind looks at that and says, that's ridiculous. Right. I'm not, I'm not buying that. <clears throat> it's ludicrous. Because Jesus is very rarely presented in a logical and a rational and a, in a, in a, in an appropriate way right. in our day. Very rarely. But not only is this false Christ rejected because of that, but the cheap counterfeits are also the ones that are being embraced by unwary and myopic Christians. Those who place tradition above doctrine. Those who <clears throat> exalt their ism above rightly dividing the Word of God. Those who exalt their private interpretation over line upon line right. and precept upon precept. Exactly. Let's read this morning, beginning in Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, 17. And when he was going forth into the way, Jesus, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he's excited, isn't he? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Thou knowest the commandments. <laughs> interesting, interesting thing to put forth. Thou knowest the commandments. Do thou do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus said, beholding him, loved him. Then Jesus beholding him loved him, and said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Turn to Luke chapter 8 now. Luke chapter 8 and verse 40. And when it came to pass when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received Him. For they were all waiting for Him. Now He had just come back over across the Sea of Galilee to, from uh, the Gatherings there. <clears throat> they were all waiting for Him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stenched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. 
People thronged him. They were waiting for him. They received him gladly. Turn with, to me with turn uh, to John chapter six now. Oh, they were waiting for him. And in John chapter six, beginning in verse twenty-four, we're going to read a large chunk here. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took ship and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now that puts things in perspective for them there. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He, give, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Well, they asked the right question. Now he's going to explain some things to them. What exactly what giving him that bread might entail. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise, up, raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Believeth is more than just mental assent. We've been through that so many times. We understand that. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Oh, the mockings begin, don't they? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, And they shall be taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which, of, which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he hath eaten me. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. The, su the sustenance that you really need is to be conformed into my image. This is what he's trying to teach them. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when he had, they had heard this, said, 
This is a hard saying. You can hear it. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What in it ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye go away also? Or will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word and Your truth. I ask You to guide my tongue this morning, Lord, that I say nothing that is, or that I say nothing that is contrary to Your Word. Give me strength, Lord, as we continue to study and to learn of You. In Jesus' name. Now, it's the very common misconception in our culture and society that very many, very many, if not most, people are accepted by Jesus. Right. That's just the common assumption. That He embraces them with deep empathy and love. That He is almost universally tolerant right. of mankind. This is the primary uh, aspect of the Jesus that is portrayed today. Judgment, if ever there even be such a thing, is reserved for the very few, the very the most egregious of offenders. You know, people like you know Pharisees and legalists. <laughs> yeah. People that people that try to force Jesus on you. Those those are the ones that are are up for judgment. Paul told the Corinthians, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity or the singleness, that straight line singleness which is Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, the apostles, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel which he had not accepted, he might well bear with him. What is Christendom well bearing with today, if not all of these things? Right. Other Jesuses, other spirits, other gospels, none which can be conformed to the scriptures. Right. They pick and choose what they want, and they set it out. And they have enough truth in there to deceive the wary, the, the unwary. To deceive those who are not exercising their discernment. Mm -hmm. You know, here in North, really North Central, all the way down to South Missouri, back in the mid-1800s, during the Civil War, you had guerrilla warfare going on, where a bunch of, a, a, a bunch of guys who were sympathetic to the Southern cause didn't join the Confederate Army, but they defended their own homes right here in Missouri. And they called them guerrillas. And very often, you would have these guys, after they defeated some Union regiments or something, would take the Union coats and put them on. For a various number of reasons. But they found out it was very effective. They found out that if another Union regiment was coming to them and saw their blue coats, they didn't do anything initially even hailed them. And so they had a great advantage in that deception. And the enemy didn't realize, and because the enemy looked enough like the Union soldiers, they didn't realize it was deception until it was too late. How often does that happen to professing Christians? Right. How deep in deception does someone have? How close to something that is so very deceptive does someone have to get before they realize it's deception and then it's too late? Mm. Right. Because they're either caught in it or they're cut off. Right. The bread of deceit is sweet to a man, the Proverbs say, but afterwards his mouth should be filled with gravel. Deception is sweet. 
to a man. In Mark 10 there, we saw the rich young ruler running to Jesus. He didn't just stroll up to him. He was excited. He was running up to Jesus. He kneeled before him. What must I do? But you know, Jesus just didn't live up to his expectations. So he went away sorrowful. His Jesus, his Jesus would never expose him and ask him to sacrifice so much. Yeah. No, that's just that was just unreasonable. Huh? Was he looking for another Messiah? Was he led of another spirit looking for this? Was it another gospel that this rich young ruler was interested in? We saw there in Luke that he was gladly received. They were waiting for him. He just crossed over from delivering that demoniac. News travels fast. All the things that he'd done before. Oh, they, they were looking for him. And they were waiting. You know, I've noticed that people are okay with Jesus as long as it's somebody else's demons he's casting out. Mm. <laughs> but when Jesus puts his finger on the spot, they will always want him to depart out of their coast. Yeah. No, that's not Jesus. That must be somebody else because Jesus is love. Hmm. Get out of here. We don't want you here. That, that fully clothed and in his right mind thing, oh, it's just so foreign to most people. You've gone too far now, Jesus. Oh, they would have obvious, obviously preferred a Jesus that didn't cramp their style. Right. And as he went, the Bible says, the people thronged him. Oh, they don't mind associating with this Jesus. They don't mind associating with him, but only one reached out and touched him. Only one wanted that Jesus. Can I ask people, are you, oh, are you, are you a Christian? Yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian that loves the Bible, loves to obey the Bible, walks after Jesus, loves Jesus with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. And you can see their eyelids start going up and they take a couple of steps back. Oh, that's just a little extreme, don't you think? Yeah. 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 Jesus is extreme. People will only follow Jesus so far before they conspire with the devil to change him into something that will fit their own molds. That's right. One man said, our love for truth is measured by how far toward perishing we are willing to go without seeking to save ourselves with a lie. That's how much you love Jesus. How far are you willing to go? How close to Jesus, this Jesus, are you willing to go without deciding to save yourself with a false Christ? Hmm. Well, I'll go just this far. Like I mentioned earlier, draw that line in the sand. That's how far I'm going. I'm not going any farther. Any Jesus that's beyond that line can't really be the real Jesus because He doesn't live up to the aspirations and ideas that I have about who I think God is. Yeah, yeah. Just doesn't fit the mold. In John chapter 6 there, we see that they just couldn't accept the truth. They were looking for another Jesus. One not so demanding. He told them, unless you become so intimately involved with me that we essentially become one in thought, in motive, in character, you cannot become partakers of this divine nature. Right. You cannot be my disciples. You cannot say you're following me unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Unless we become one, you are not my follower. Right. Adam Clark says that he said, oh, this is a hard saying. Who, who can hear this? Adam Clark says, who can dis digest such doctrine as this? Oh, they, they hate this doctrine. It is intolerable. Clark says it means. It's impracticable. He says there's a similar saying in Euripides. Tell me whether thou wouldest that I should speak unto thee a soft lie or a harsh truth. Speak unto us smooth things. 
Remember they told the prophet, we don't want all these harsh things. Don't be telling us all these things. Speak unto us smooth things. That's the Jesus we want. Yeah, yeah. Smooth things. Adam Clark goes on to say, the wicked word of a lying world is in general better received than the holy word of God. Yeah, true. Right. Oh, and isn't that so? Clark said that back in his day. Think about it today. They are more willing to hear the wickedness out in the world, the philosophies, the other religions, all these secular humanistic ideas, but don't tell me what the Bible says. Can't, we, can't, we can't stomach that, and we don't want to hear it. When they there in John chapter 6 realized that it would cost them a whole lot more than they were willing to sacrifice, they released truth and grasped onto a lie. Right. They turned from life and embraced death. This, this Jesus, this, this bread of life was just unpalatable to them. They didn't want anything to do with it. Conformity is only proportional to their own preconceived ideas of necessity. I'm only going to conform to the point that I think it's necessary to do so. Right. And I'm going to make the decision where that line is. Truth, they say, is relative. You know the reason relativism is so appealing? Is because unlike truth, it's really convenient. Relative truth is convenient. You can make up whatever it is you want and that's my truth. Yeah. Well, that might be true for you, but what's true for me is, no. It's so convenient, relativism is. And why wouldn't it be? I mean, honestly. It's conceived in the mind that way. In the mind. Convenience. The first thought is convenience. That's what relativism is all about. Okay, what is best for me? What would I like more? But you know, to their chagrin, true, by definition, can be nothing but absolute. Right. There is only one truth. Mm -hmm. There can't possibly be any other. <clears throat> Because if, it tr if it's true, it eradicates everything else. Right. Mm -hmm. If you distort any part of truth, it becomes false. Right. Mm -hmm. If you change any part of Jesus, it's no longer Jesus. <laughs> right. Right. It's another Jesus. It's another spirit. It's another gospel. Right. Any part of him. Mm -hmm. no, they don't like to hear that. They don't like that. They want to adapt Jesus. Right. Make him more palatable mm -hmm. to the to the modern American whatever. I want to talk about some traits of some of these false Christs. But an intimate knowledge of the truth of that which is true will inevitably reveal the false. You know, that's why the people at the banks, they don't teach them what all the, all the counterfeit money looks like. They teach them what the real thing looks like. That way when a counterfeit passes by, it's easier to spot. Something, something's wrong. They don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we should be. Amen. So we keep the Bible, the, this biblical Christ in mind while we examine some of these traits which expose the lies of these false Christs. Inevitably, a false Christ, his teaching violates some part of Scripture. Yes. He cannot wholly be uh, mm -hmm. reconciled with Scripture. It's decidedly unbiblical. Well, they have their little pet verses. They have their ideas and things that they twist completely out of context. He's got the word of faith there thinking every, everybody that believes in God should be rich and powerful and healthy. And the only ones that are rich are the ones that teach that foolishness because they've got others gripped by their own greed. Mm -hmm. That's why people follow that stuff. They're greedy. Right. Decidedly unbiblical. Few even recognize that their concept of the spotless Lamb of God is blemished and wrinkled. If they just look at the rest of the pattern, they would say, wait, that don't fit. Right. Something's wrong. They're not watching. 
They're not paying attention for whatever reason. I think it was Ravenhill said, At this grim hour, the world sleeps in darkness and the church sleeps in the light. Now I think there's a remnant that's wide awake. Yes. And I hope that we're among that. But this quote's not altogether an unreasonable assumption. Remember the ten virgins? We must not be part of that slumbering brood. Right. We can't. God said the Bible teaches us that those who have their eyes open will not, not be overtaken. Will not be overcome by the thief in the night. But this false Christ can't be plugged into the Scriptures and all of the Scriptures. And if you're sleeping, you're going to miss those parts. Right. Awake. Keep our eyes open. This false Christ arbitrarily violates the Father's will. You know, Jesus said, I do nothing but that which my Father tells me. That's all I do is what the will of God is. Not my will, but thine be done. That was his heart. That's what he did all the time. Not so with some of these other Jesuses. They'll follow some. They'll get to a point. They'll get to a line. Always look for that line. Mm. When you're talking with somebody, reasoning with somebody, reasoning over the Scriptures, always look for that line because it'll always be there. Oh, the Bible says this, and that line says, but... No, there's no buts. The Bible says this. It conforms and fits to the rest of Scripture. This is Jesus, not yours. Right. You have violated part of the Father's will. Mm. This false Jesus makes void the law through faith. Antinomianism. Right. This Jesus is an antinomian Jesus. He's against law. He has come and taken something else and replaced the law of God with some other law of love or whatever the case they call it. And have no concept what love even means. He's an antinomian right. teacher. Anti has several different meanings. The two most prominent are against as in opposed to and one meaning in place of. Taking the place of. Both are antinomian. Right. There is nothing more antichrist than an imitation of the real thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, I promise you. Don't look for the devil to come storming through the door with pork, with, with with horns and a and a pitchfork. He ain't gonna do that. Right. He's coming as an angel of light. He's gonna look more like us than he looks like anybody else. Mm. That's what he's gonna look like. Oh, but people are looking for the wrong thing because they've been convinced by these false Christs that that's not how He works. Mm. That's how He works. And what does the devil do? Destroys confidence in the Word of God. Yes. That's what he does. To say that Jesus has come and changed the law and changed things and decided to do things different. Changed his father's mind for him. Jesus authored the whole thing. Right. He didn't come and change his mind. He didn't decide to do something different. Oh, those people, I can't believe. Now I've got to go to plan B. No, I'm sorry. This thing, this Bible's flat all the way yes. through. Amen. All the way through it, it's flat. The differentiation of scriptures, pitting Moses against Jesus. Oh, how much more antichrist and diabolical can you get? It's good. You can't get more diabolical than that. Right. This Antichrist hath not the Father and the Son. That's specific. John specifically said that. He hath not, hath not the Father and the Son. Oh, you pit those two against each other. Go ahead and try it. Antichrist. False Christ. In place of the Savior. 
This, this, this false Christ can be overtly tolerant to everything mm. except the truth. Mm. He is overtly tolerant. So true. He will put up with almost anything in the name of love. You look out there today, some of these other denominations, and see the quagmire and cesspool that they have decided to go down into because they have embraced these false Christs. Oh, they'll put up with anything! But you walk up to them and say, oh, excuse me, the Bible said, oh, you devil, get out of here. Mm. Put up with anything except the truth. Oh, and they're so sweet. When we were yet down in Louisiana, there's many churches down there that were in this, this you know, movement, this, I don't even know what you call it anymore. Just the be nice group. You just be nice. Go around and give people flowers and hand them bottles of water. Never mention Jesus, never say anything like that. But you give somebody a bottle of water and, oh, you have, you have fulfilled the will of God. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, too much politeness conceals deceit. The Jesus that those people are offering is a false one. He's not the real one. They are deceiving people in their politeness. They're deceiving people. Overtly tolerant. That which I call hippie love. Mm, just yeah. love. Everything's just about love. Where'd that come from? It didn't come from God. It came from some long-haired fruit at Woodstock. Yeah. That's where it came from. It's not God. Love, love real love is forfeited when truth is rejected. Mm. You no more have love. Right. I have tried to explain this to some of my family and my older children. I've tried to explain this and they just, it just, right, they don't get it. No, you have no real love. You have no concept of who God is. There's no way that you can truly love. Yes, you have human emotions and those things, but that's not what love is. That's not what we're talking about. Right. Love is forfeited when you deny truth and reject truth. You just forfeited love. Exactly. It's gone. The only way to get it back is to embrace truth because that's where love resides. Right. In God, in truth. And because He's overly tolerant, just humanistic goals. The goals are all humanistic. Happiness is paramount. Their Jesus has no problem with anything that they do as long as they're happy. Mm. As long as they're fulfilled. That's what their Jesus is all about. Humanism. Humanistic goals. These humanistic goals where sincerity trumps truth. Yeah. Oh, he's so sincere. So what? That Muslim that blew himself up and destroyed a building. I'm sure he was real sincere too. Right. Mm -hmm. Sincerity. All well, they think, well, only if he, if he's sincere, there's no way he can be deceived. One of the quickest paths to deception is to think you're immune from it. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, please believe that. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm in this church. Everything's okay. I'm immune. No, you're not. I'm not. Brother Mark, nobody here is immune from deception if we lay down our, our discernment of the Bible. Right. Nobody. For one minute, you let those, let, open up those gates. Pull that horse in there and see if that devil don't take you down. Right. I guarantee it. O oh, tolerance. They call you and come. Come or come or not, just as you are. It doesn't matter. We're all one great big universal church. Just just come or not as you are. No pressure. No assembly required. That can be taken in two ways, can it? Yeah. You don't have to add anything. You don't have to change anything. Just come as you are. Jesus, God is love. Everybody just come. Just as you are. Don't change anything. Just say this prayer and then everything will be alright. Right. 
You know, that lie has sent more people to hell yes. than almost any other heresy in history. Right. Amen. Oh, these false Christs, everybody loves them. Everybody loves this false Christ. That's why they throng around. That's why you see all these happy little meetings going on all over the country where there's, there's no real truth, but everybody loves this Jesus because he invites them to NASCAR and they have hot dog stands and everything and puppet shows for the people. It's just so fun. Everybody loves this Jesus until the real is revealed. Oh, okay. We'll follow Jesus. We'll throng along with Him. And then He says, puts His finger on the spot. Why do they hate Him? Because He reveals that their deeds are evil. No, you're wrong. Jesus tells you. You're wrong. You're messed up. You're crooked. You need to straighten out. Oh, you can't be. You're not the real Jesus. You're not the real Jesus. You're not, you're not, the, you're not the Jesus I know. That's not my God. So I'm my president. When they realize where the train's going, uh oh, we need to stop at a station and get off and divert this thing. I don't want to go there. That's the whole thing. I don't want to go there. That's not where I'm going. Oh, everybody accepts Jesus into their hearts. That's not hard to get people to do. You feed them this baloney, this false Jesus, and those that are greedy, those that want everything done easily for them. Oh, wow. I can't give that. Okay, sure, fine. I'll say the prayer. Yeah. yeah. I've accepted Jesus into my heart. No, you haven't. The only way to accept the false is to accept the real. You've got to ignore the real so you can grab onto that false thing. Oh, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus isn't just going to come and lay it all out before here you go. Everything that I've done, all my righteousness and all my good deeds are imputed and laid on your account. Now you don't have to worry about anything. When God looks at you, He just sees me standing in the way. That's not Jesus. No. That's this false lying concept. Oh, and it makes me so mad to see somebody intentionally take the take the the, the, the glory of God and twist it. Right. And mar it and turn it into something despicable. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's not Jesus. Just read your Bible. I mean, come on. It's not that difficult. One man said, For I have sworn thee fair and thought thee bright. Who art as black as hell and dark as night. Their deceptions makes one see error as truth. Mm. Oh, you look at that, it looks so bright and fair. Ah, it's really black as the pit. Why do you see it bright and fair? Because you want to. Right. Because you want to see it that way. Right. That's what I want. That is the image of Jesus I have raised up in my mind and heart. And that's what I want to follow. Oh, you better break that thing to pieces and knock it over. Yes. Who could possibly dislike this easygoing, all-inclusive and uncondemning Jesus? Oh, who could dislike you? God. God hates it. God hates right. it. Oh, God hates it. Oh, but He does so much good. They feed people all over. God hates it. He utterly despises the marring of Christ. Yes. He hates it. Lovers of righteousness, haters of iniquity should hate that. Oh, should despise it. But just like the devil, he plays on people's sympathies. Mm -hmm. That's where the liberals and the leftists and the antinomians learned it from. They attack anyone who disagrees with them with words. Oh, how long? Oh, you're just unloving. Mm -hmm. Well, wait a minute. How do you defend something like that? How do you defend a broad accusation just thrown out? You know the new one now? You see it all? Oh, oh, they're just haters. Haters? And Christians for so long have just shied. No, wait, no, no, no. Don't see me like that. 
They just crumble. Christians, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not unloving. No, I'm not hateful. No, I'm not a hater. I'm not, I'm really not. Okay, I'll accept you because I'm not a hater. Yeah. I don't want you to see me like that. Yeah. Oh, they crumble. They don't want to perceive, be perceived as unloving, as haters. So true. And this has led to just a complete failure of restraint. Think about uh, Samson and Delilah. How did she get him, finally? You don't love me. Yeah. You're not showing me enough love. You're a hater. You're not telling me that you're lying to me. You're a hater. That's how she got it. Right. That's how she got it. The proverb says, When he speaketh fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Their, dis they, their, dis their deceptiveness. And they deceive with fair speech. And their hearts are full of abominations. That's how they get you. Fair speech. They make it sound good. Mm. Oh, well, and everybody looking on. Oh, well, yeah, he's being fair. You, you did say that was kind of ugly way you said that. You're a hater. Oh, that's fair. Their fair speeches are winning them over, aren't they? Paul said, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Yes. Well, they don't speak according to the right doctrine, but they have fair speeches. They say things sweetly. Their, 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 their verbiage and rhetoric is flowery, flowery and buttery. You know what? I don't care if somebody calls me a hater. I don't care if somebody calls me unloving because I know what the true definition of it is. Right. I don't define love by, by hedonistic humanism. I define it by what the Bible says. So I'm not concerned. Unloving? Okay, according to your definition of it, I probably am. Mm -hmm. you, you're just a hater. Oh, embrace that. Absolutely, I'm a hater. Oh, I hate lies. I hate iniquity. Jesus was a hater. Did you know that? No, Jesus, no, Jesus was a hater. The Bible says he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Right. Yeah, I hate I can't love without hate. Right. It's impossible. They're two sides of the same coin. And anybody that says any different is either ignorant or trying to lie. Deceptive. So yes, I embrace the term hater. Doesn't bother me. As long as you're hating the right thing. You hate iniquity. Right. This false Jesus is so soft on sin. Did you notice that? That's, that's, that's how so much of the corruption is leaked into the professing church right. of our day. He's soft on sin. That line I was talking about, he never draws one. Right. Oh, people do it all the time. This is the line, Jesus, I'm drawing. I'm not going past it. This false Jesus, he don't draw any lines for the people. No, you do whatever you want. It's okay. Embracing of the truth will only extend to the boundaries of their own self-interest and convenience, regardless of law, commandment or propriety, the false Christ will never call on them. Or well, the false Christ will never call them on that or nor ask them to step beyond it. So as much truth as they want to grab a hold to, as much truth as they want, they, it, it, that line of there is at their own self-interest. That's the boundaries of as far as they're going to go. Convenience, doesn't matter what the law is, doesn't matter what the commandment is, doesn't matter what Jesus actually said, it doesn't matter. The, my convenience is going to mark that line. Yeah. And this false Christ, he's never going to call somebody to go come over that. You're okay just like you are. It's okay. You know, because after all, Jesus hung out with sinners, right? Yeah. I mean, you're, oh, he hung out and ate with sinners and harlots and just... He just went into the pits of the worst dregs parts of Jerusalem and he just hung out with them. No, he didn't. In no way, shape, or form. He's soft on sin because he redefines iniquity. Mm. You know, some of these people, they've brought, they, they, have, they have defined sin so broadly that it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> so all of a sudden, no sin, no, no, no infirmity. No small infirmity of the flesh is any worse than any of the biggest blatant sins. I had one guy tell me, actually tell me one time, arguing on this point. And I said, you can't tell me 
that because I misspell a word, that you can operate in, in sin. Oh yeah, sin is sin. He said, sin is sin. See, no, yeah, no. You're missing the concept of what sin is. You've been lied to. You've swallowed one of these false Christs. There's a vast difference. None can escape it. And because nobody cannot sin, everybody sins every day in thought, word, and deed. Isn't that one of the planks of the Calvinist Manifesto? One of the Calvinists told me that one day. I said, well, you need to get born again. If you must sin every day in thought, word, and deed, then you need to get born again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did Peter say about those that cannot cease from sin? Bad company. But yeah, so this, this false Jesus, he understands that, so he just kind of includes everything. So he's all, he's all inclusive. He always is a misrepresentation of the real. Mm -hmm. Even mocks at righteousness. Yeah. This Jesus does. Oh, you think you're holier than everybody else? You think you're gonna get you think you're gonna get closer to heaven than I am? How many times we've heard stuff like that? This false grace, this irrelevance of obedience, this this uh, how do they use it? This antagonistic or uh, phrase, lordship salvation. Yeah, the first time I ever heard that, somebody's telling me. Oh, you can't believe lordship salvation. I thought, there's not any other kind. Yeah, right. There is no other kind of salvation. Right. What are you talking about? But this false Jesus, he loves that, pushes it. The false Jesus is irrational. Just completely irrational. Builds things upon the sand. He's inconsistent. Truth suddenly becomes relative. It's contingent upon their own judgment. Their own desires and needs, their own subjectivity. Mm -hmm. And how inconsistent and irrational is something like that? If we based any idea on that principle right there, contingent on my own judgment, my own desires and needs, my own subjectivity, let's see, how many different ones of those we have in here? Yeah. Oh, wow. No, no wonder people reject Jesus. Mm -hmm. So blatantly. They hear this foolishness from so many different mouths. Right. So many different false Jesus and false Christs. They throw the whole thing out. Not saying they wouldn't do that if they heard the real one. But like I said earlier, why not give them the opportunity? Right. Oh, I would love for every man to be presented with the biblical Jesus. Yes. Oh, Truth suddenly becomes relative. It's illogical. It's unjust. Right. You think about these false Jesuses. There are some on one side that sends people to hell for something that's not... Wait a minute. That's not... That, that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. Oh, no. no we can't accept you into our church because you've got something in your past and we can't... Wait. Where's that? Okay, that's, that's unjust. Right. God didn't do that. They did. Oh, then right on the other side, they're unjust in mercy. No, it doesn't matter what you've done, where you are, what you are presently doing. Come on in. It's okay. That's unjust. It's not mercy. It's unjust. Right. This false Jesus inoculates against truth. Yes. It contains just enough truth to deceive. And this is very important. Truth rejected as a lie because they'll only take so much. Mm -hmm. Nope. I'm not believing that. How many times? How many times, honestly, anybody that's ever spoken to someone else about doctrine, you're sitting there talking, and all of a sudden you breach a point, and all of a sudden, blink, they tune out. Completely turn you off. You ever had that experience? It's like, <laughs> I know I'm going nowhere now. I got to a point, I've got to their line. That's yeah. what I did. I got to their line, tried to drag them over, and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not accepting that. Unbelievable. Charles Finney said, The church is now filled up with hypocrites because people were never made to see that unless they made an entire consecration of all to Christ, all their time, all their talents, all their influence, they would never get to heaven. 
Many think they can be Christians and yet dream along through life and use all their time and property for themselves, only giving a little now and then, just to save appearances, and when they can do it with perfect convenience. But it is a sad mistake, and they will find it so if they do not employ their energies for God. And when they die, instead of finding heaven at the end of the path they are pursuing, they will find hell there. Right. Oh, how many people do you think on that day following after their false Jesus right into the ditch? Think fire and brimstone when I say ditch. Why? Because they refuse to see the truth. Right. They don't want to cross that line. <clears throat> One of their old philosophers said, Whenever therefore people are deceived and form opinions wide of the truth, it is clear that the error has slid into their minds through the medium of certain resemblances to that truth. Yes. That's how you get it in. How do you get them to take the medicine? How do you get a dog to take a large pill, wrap it up in a piece of meat? That's how he's going to get it. What we have today is the mass marketing of Christ. Mm -hmm. A one-size-fits-all Jesus. Yes. There's just enough truth mixed into the lie as each person needs in order to be deceived. That's why you have you know, the, the heathen rock star only needs a little truth to maintain his deception. That's all he needs, just a little bit. Jesus, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, I remember hearing about that. That's a cool guy. That's all he needs to maintain that deception. Just that. The conservative Mennonite pads his deception with great amounts of moral rectitude and tradition. Thus the devil has masterfully made their virtues the means of deceiving them. He has not held them back but push them past the bounds of Scripture yeah. to the point that many act as though they are more righteous than Moses or the apostles. More understanding of the teachings of Jesus than the apostles. More understanding of the Word of God than Moses. Well, that was Moses that said that. No, that was God that yeah. said that. Amen. Settle that right now. That Amen. was God that said Amen. that. Amen. We must be ever diligent to present the true Christ, the biblical Jesus, in contradistinction to the plethora of false Christs being presented in our hour. Oh, I'm a firm believer in that. They hold up on them false Christs? No, you put Jesus up next to it. One man said, when the imitation operates alone and is not thrown into contrast with the real, it's difficult to discern. When life collides with the dead imitation, the imitation is shown to be what it really is, death. Right. This contrast of life and death divides. Yes. It's like these, you know, piece of paper. Uh, paper can be very white. You know how many different shades of white? I wonder what it would be if I put it up here. A little bit, not much. What about the white wall? Let's see the difference. There you go. Look at the difference. Which one's white? That's the contrast I'm talking about. Right. You put up the real Jesus next to theirs. Why do you think they run? Why do you think they blank out? They don't want to see it. No, that's too clear. I'll have to change something. And I'm not willing to do that. That's where the issue lies. Right. right there. So yes, we must present Christ alongside of their false ones. It's not ignorance keeping anyone from the truth. It's presumption. Mm -hmm. It's cowardice. Well, I'm afraid of what might happen if I believe that. Come on. I'm afraid of what might happen if you don't. Amen. Right. Amen. As we've seen, the tactics of the enemy are many and varied. But his most pernicious one is surely the misrepresentation of the Word of God. The presentation of so many false Christs that just seem right to so many unwary and undiscerning people. Well, it just seems right though, doesn't it? Bible aside. Mm -hmm. No, I said, Bible yeah. aside. Yeah. It just seems right. 
Just because we haven't fallen for the obvious doesn't mean we are immune to the subtle. Yes. We must watch and pray just like Jesus instructed. The closer one is to the truth, the less likely he is to see his own deception and the more likely he is to overlook the small inconsistencies. But remember, the ability to see a lie as a lie comes from not believing it. Mm. Well, wait a minute. What did you just say? Wait, I don't remember something in the Bible. That doesn't mesh with what I know of the Bible. Oh, it's okay to go study and find out. It's okay not to have all the answers immediately at your fingertips. But you better have an overall understanding of Scripture and what it is, the character of God, who He is, so that when some of that comes across your desk, you can say, either file 13 it right away, or you can say, that's interesting, I've never seen that, I'll have to look into it. But you better do one of the two. The lie will never comport with all of Scripture. Right. We must simply believe every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Because the bread of the seed may be sweet, but it's not irresistible. We can't resist it. Ah, oh, so sweet. No, no. <clears throat> Jeremiah said, A wonderful and a horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. Yeah. Oh. oh, what a scathing indictment. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Oh, may that never be said of me. Oh. And my people love to have it so. Oh, I love being deceived. How many people? How many people would raise their hands? How many? How many people like to be deceived? Raise your hand. Not many. No, nobody. I, I grant you, nobody would raise their hand at that. And yet, God said they love to have it yes. so. Yes. God forbid that we would love to have it so that we would embrace an apparent gift, thinking that the devil has acquiesced and grown tired of the battle, that we might allow our walls to be breached. And our, and our city sacked simply because it's convenient. How many times did Jesus warn, be not deceived? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I am so glad this is going on the World Wide Web too. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jeff. I want to say one thing quickly. Jesus said... Take heed that ye be not deceived. And then he said that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. How do you reconcile the two? <laughs> Brother Jeff mentioned this, that, that it would be so subtle that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Okay? Go back to what I've taught you about election. Mm -hmm. There will be a bride. The question is, will you be a part of it? Okay? God has elected there will be a bride. He's elected a program. There will be a spotless bride for Christ. That doesn't ensure you personally will be there. Right. Okay? You have a personal responsibility to maintain uh, your understanding and your relationship with God so you can be a part of the bride. So, what he's saying here to the individual disciples, take heed that no man deceives you. Right. And then he said it would be so subtle... That if it were possible, it would thwart my plan of having a bride for Christ. Yep. Wow. 